Well, uh, good evening and uh, welcome to the last session of the day. Uh, you've chosen Build Your Legos, a practitioner's guide to building reusable components with me, Chris Greetings. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am the director of digital experience platforms at a company called Bounteous. Uh, we're located in uh, North America with offices throughout the United States and Canada. Uh, I've been a developer uh, for over 25 years now. I've uh, been working at Bounteous and with Drupal since uh, 2009 or so. And a fun fact about me is that I'm currently half finished with a 9,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. And in case you want to see what it looks like, um, the, uh, well, the workspace is about two and a half meters by two and a half meters, and when the puzzle's done, it'll be you know, roughly two meters by one and a half meters. So, getting there. Um, so who's Bounteous? Uh, I won't uh, spend as much time as the marketers would like me to talk about us, but um, we're a company, we do lots of great things. We have a, you know, an amazing Drupal team. Uh, we do more than just Drupal though. We have engineers that uh, cover the gamut. Uh, we do uh, marketing, uh, analytics and insight, experience design, you name it, we do it. Uh, so if you'd like me to ramble on about that, uh, see me afterwards. So, what's the big idea about this talk? What you know? What do I think you should take away from the talk when you leave? Uh, and I broke it down into three different questions. You know, why should you build your Legos, or why should you be building reusable uh, components? Um, I think, in a nutshell, it's um, consistency uh, and efficiency, uh, and we'll talk about those things along the way. The other thing is, you know, how did we go about doing this? Uh, now I know uh, there are many ways to do this, uh, and in fact, the way that we do it might not be suitable for you, and that's fine. I think what you should really take away from this talk is the more the big picture, kind of thinking that went behind it, um, and, and how we got uh, to the decisions we got to. And then lastly, uh, what have we learned so far? So when I originally gave this talk, it was uh, last year around this time, uh, at a talk in the United States, uh, and since then, we've had about a year to ruminate on, on what's happening and, and to use the components more and get um, some more ideas. So I will share some of those learnings with you. So why should we be doing this? Why should we be, be building Legos? Um, and before we jump ahead to that, the one disclaimer is we should really agree on what the definition of a Lego is. And so uh, I went to a really nice talk this morning, talked about web components. I'm not going to talk about them here. Uh, what I'm really focused on are the reusable building blocks that our content editors are going to use to build Drupal pages. Uh, and so, uh, away we go. Uh, Component-based approach, I'm sure lots of people are using it. Uh, for those of you that are not using it yet, um, we love it, uh, and it's got a number of advantages, I think. You know, one is the, the idea that the content editors have a great deal of flexibility to build the pages. Uh, they, they no longer want to be, um, you know, building pages that fit a template, they want to be able to create that template for themselves on the fly. And the best way to do this is with, you know, components. The other thing is, <clears throat> a lot of the customers that we've worked with as we've moved them onto new uh, Drupal systems, you know, one of the, the problems we've had in the past is that uh, developers have had to be, you know, part of the content creation process. And, you know, we don't want to do that. Um, one, we don't like to do that, at least I don't like to do that. And two, we don't want to be a bottleneck um, to, to the marketers. We want them to have a faster time to market. Um, if we spend less time helping them do the day-to-day -day content creation, then we can solve like cool problems. Uh, and we can be really focused on the problems that matter, the problems that are going to bring more people to our website, problems that are you know, um, you know, preventing people from, from doing what they need to do on a daily basis. So uh, it's really important for us to do that. And using this component-based approach, uh, we can also add some guardrails to help the content editors out. Um, clearly with a really uh, rigid approach, you can do this as well, but um, you know, we can do this and, and make sure everyone's happy, uh, the people that are trying to protect the, the brand as well as the content editors themselves. And lastly, personalization, maybe testing, hopefully we're all doing that, uh, but a component-based approach really makes it easy to swap out pieces and parts of the site um, so we can do a good job with this. So, when we started thinking about um, not only using this component-based approach, but uh, you know, building our own component library, there are a number of different problems we were trying to solve. Uh, and being an agency, doing lots of different websites, you know, there's some efficiencies of scale that we can get 
uh, by doing things one time and then reusing them over and over and over again. So if you think about it, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the components that we built out and you build on your sites, they're used, you know, on every different website. You know, pretty much every website has a quote of some sort. We have hero banners, we have two ups, we have lots of those different things. And so by, you know, building these components once and distributing them along the way, uh, it can make us more efficient, right? If we fix the bug, we can fix it in one place and distribute it as opposed to finding the, you know, 30 different places amongst our sites that we do it. Uh, we also um, have some issues with consistencies across the websites. So if you think about it, if you're, you know, doing the copy paste thing, uh, rebuilding this functionality over and over and over again, what you find is you're going to run into parts <coughs> uh, of these components in other systems and they're going to be different and you're going to, you know, not know exactly why they're different. Do we mean them to be different? Uh, is there a specific reason or not? And so this leads us to having a lot of, you know, system specific knowledge that we don't really need. Uh, meeting the regulatory requirements is pretty important. Uh, you know, as an example of, you know, as accessibility. Uh, now, to be clear, we should do that because it's the right thing to do and not because a bunch of lawyers tell us we need to do it. Uh, but, um, you know, building components in a standard way uh, can help us make sure that our sites are accessible. And then lastly, uh, working with designers, I want to have a common language uh, and a common you know, tool set that we can use uh, so we can spend less time on building the things that we already know how to build and more, th you know, more time on, on the things that are going to make this site unique. <clears throat> so a number of years ago, we built a website for Wilson Sporting Goods, and uh, this was one of the components we built. We uh, call it the quilt, uh, and basically the quilt is a, a row that you can add two by twos, one by ones, one by twos, and two by twos, and any combination that you want, um, and, and you know build a pretty unique site. Now, <clears throat> um, we built this in Drupal 7, uh, and you know we were you know this was right around the time or just before Drupal 8 had come out, uh, and once we were finished with it, um, we had a couple developers that decided they wanted to learn Drupal 8, and I thought this would be a neat experiment to take this from you know, our Drupal 7 uh, installation and make it into Drupal 8. <clears throat> so once they finished it, we showed it off to a few people, and they kind of liked it. In fact, they wanted to use it. Um, and so that was uh, an unexpected problem. Uh, so we had to figure out fairly quickly how we were going to you know, make this scale, how we were going to do this across many sites. So, you know, what do we do? You know, the first, th first question we ask ourselves is what should we build? And to, um, to, to determine this, we started by auditing recent sites we had built, uh, you know, some even a little bit older, uh, some that were coming up, some in different uh, platforms that we, we built at Bounteous to just kind of get a feel for the types of components that were out there. And we had two, you know, two criteria that we used pretty much to decide whether or not to build these components out. One was, you know, how often were they used? So if something was used all over, uh, pretty much every site, that was a really good candidate for us to build. Uh, again, you think of you know, hero banners and, you know, frequently asked questions and things of that nature. Um, you know, so that was like one criteria. And then the other criteria was we wanted to make sure that that functionality uh, was common across the components. So. If uh, someone's hero banner did some really funky stuff, we left that off of our component. We didn't want to uh, to, to bring that in to start. Uh, and it's just kind of an interesting note. While we started with the quilt, because it really wasn't used in a lot of sites, uh, probably was going to be lower in the priority scale for us. <clears throat> so what do we end up with? We built 12 to start, and even dozen. Um, and this is by no means all of the components we use on all of our sites. Uh, there are lots of different components we use uh, as well, some less popular, some very specific for the sites. Uh, but this was a good starting place, or at least we thought it was. Uh, and this is a list that we continue to talk about expanding um, as that time goes on. So I'm going to buzz through them all so you can see them quick. Uh, accordion, uh, an alert. Uh, so the hero banner, um, and this one's kind of interesting. There's three different hero banners here. Um, there's one at the top, there's two stack slides, and then there's a carousel. 
Uh, and so a lot of our uh, components have a lot of functionality baked into them. Uh, they're, they're really, um, uh, really flexible. You know, call out, frequently asked questions, <clears throat> a grid, and just kind of scroll through this guy too. Um, you know, one of the interesting things for us was as we did our audit, we found, you know, most of our sites, whether you used something like a grid, were only three or four wide. Uh, and so our grid is, you know, three or four wide, you choose. Um, but there are certainly ways to make this um, so that, you know, you can have, uh, you know, five wide or two wide or whatever your uh, use cases may need. Uh, overlay is kind of similar to that. Um, you know, just the difference is as you scroll over it, we're going to show you additional text. <coughs> And again, three and four wide for us, because that was common. Um, the quilt, so the thing that started it all off, uh, you'll see a, a variety of the different rows. Also, um, as a side note, all of these uh, images are coming from a site that we built uh, internally, so we could show our, uh, our design team, our developers, all those folks, you know, what we had built and how to use it. Uh, it's a sandbox where people can go play with it. We don't care what they do to it. Uh, and it also has a space theme, so I hope you like pictures of space as much as I do. Uh, quote, and you know, in this case, it's a really long quote with a background image, but it, you know, you can imagine it just has a background color um, with a quote as well. Um, we can do tabs, horizontal and vertical, uh, text divider if you want some kind of interesting, um, you know, design experience in the middle of your page. And lastly, but not least is the two column. Again, this is one of the ones we, we find ourselves uh, falling back to quite often. <clears throat> so, you've seen the components, and I'm sure in your minds you've got lots of components that you'd like to build too. And the question is how do we build them out? And again, this is kind of our method for doing this. I'm sure there are other ways to do it um, that, that might work well for you. Uh, and this is actually version two, I'll say. The first version of this was really just the custom block and the paragraph type. Uh, we started building that in the very early days of Drupal 8. Uh, so there was you know, uh, not as much development, not as much available to us. Uh, and we were using um, you know, blocks to lay out our pages. Uh, as time went on, we, uh, we started to um, evolve, uh, and we're continuing to evolve to this day, but you know, two things that happened along the way that made us change our, uh, our original approach. One is paragraphs. Um, we, like a lot of people, uh, sheepishly use paragraphs to um, control layout, right, and make it easy for our content editors to, um, uh, to control the layout on a page. Um, that worked really well for us, and then uh, Leo builders come out, right, uh, that went from a thought to an experimental module to now it's a full-blown module. And so what we ended up doing was ending on um, an approach that we could work, use both ways. Um, and so um, let's talk a little bit about this. So we have the paragraph type in the middle. Uh, you can think about that as containing the content. Uh, and then any, um, you know, uh, layout, uh, or styling issues that we want to control for just a, a specific piece of content. And then the paragraph container um, kind of bundles it all together. Uh, and it also has, um, uh, you know, fields that control functionality that affects everything that's within this container. And then eventually you can <laughs> stuff this in a custom block that we built out, uh, or you can use it within your entities like content types. So let's take an example, because uh, I'm sure that's clear as mud. Um, the paragraph type, uh, if we're thinking about like a hero banner, that's the individual <coughs> banners. So as you saw on our screen before, we could have stack banners, we could have carousels, um, but we, you know, the, each of these paragraph types represents one of those banners. And so we have the uh, headline, the subheadline, the call to action, uh, you know, is content, the background image, and then we have, um, you know, styling, theming things we're going to do with it. So um, how wide is that container? that's going to hold the text, uh, the size of the text, the size of the button, uh, color of the fonts, all that good stuff. Then the container uh, has all of that stuff. So if we have five banners, it has all the five banners. But it also has additional uh, fields that we need to control, uh, like the carousel. So which slide are we starting on? Um, you know, is it turned on automatically? And, and those types of things. <clears throat> 
So, let's walk through the hero banner a bit. Um, as I mentioned, um, you know, kind of beneath this, we're using paragraph types. So we have two different paragraph types for each of our components. One is this um, uh, uh, the banner rows or the subcomponent. Again, that's that the individual banner that we're using. Uh, and then uh, we also have the components banner, which is that whole entity um, uh, for the hero banner. Uh, container field. So what's in that? You know, kind of the container. Again, we, we have a reference, uh, entity reference revisions for the banners themselves. Um, and then uh, we, we have a numerous fields that we can use, uh, you know, to fade transition, to, you know, to do lots of different things. The, the subcomponent, so this is the actual banner itself, has a lot of fields on it. Uh, in fact, it has many more than this. This is just all it could fit on the screen. Uh, but this is a good you know, cross-section of the types of fields we have. So we have everything from like the CTA uh, or the headline, you know, the content that we talked about. Uh, and then we have some styling um, uh, fields as well, like additional classes that you can add or the CTA color, those types of things. And then um, we also have a, for the hero banner itself, um, uh, we have some other fields that we deal with on things that are not uh, desktop. Um, you know, like are we going to drop the text below the image or not? And we have lots of fields. Um, I'll we'll get into this a little later. Our, our uh, content editors, especially the ones that we're, we're building for, are pretty sophisticated. They want that power. And so they'll, they'll wade through a few extra fields for us uh, to have that additional power at their hands. <clears throat> so uh, let's walk through this um, and just see what it looks like to edit one of these um, banners. So this is the page that I showed before with the banners on it. Uh, and you can see here we have the three different components, and we're going to edit the bottom one, which was the one that had the carousel on. And once we go in here, we have two sections we can work with. We can do work on the slides, or we can work on the carousel options. In this case, I'm just going to walk through the um, the first slide. You know, and again, we have them broken down into um, you know essentially you know, content uh, and you know styles, and then the mobile experience. And so we can. Add our background image if we want. We have the subheadline or the headline and the subheadline, call to action. So anything you consider content, we can go ahead and edit. <clears throat> and then we're going to go back to the top and we'll walk through the different styles. So again, you can there's a lot of power here for the the user. They can add additional styles if we have them in the CSS to specifically style this banner. Uh, and then we start talking about textiles. So again, how wide the, the container width is, um, the size of the text, the color of the text. And then we do the same thing with um, the image and the call to action as well. <clears throat> and then we're going to go back to the top, and this is where we're going to deal with some of the mobile aspects. Um, you know, we find a lot of times we need to drop that text because the, the, uh, um, the headline is too big, or in fact, sometimes we can just change that headline again to, to allow the um, the content editor to, to build the content the way they need to. Uh, and then you know the carousel options. So here, by default, we turn the carousel on if you have more than one banner, uh, and then they can go through and, and, and make changes to make the carousel work exactly as they want to. And then that is the finished page, and this is our carousel slide that we can see. <coughs> So, that's pretty stuff. Uh, I know it's late in the day. I don't have a lot of uh, code <laughs> slides, but we can walk through some of these things that we found to be important. Um, Lodge layout, pretty straightforward, obviously. Um, but uh, you know, a few things that we have in here, uh, we have some CSS and some JavaScript and uh, things like that. So right out of the box, our, our components are well-styled. Um, you know, certainly, you would probably update some of the styles to fit with the website itself. But if you drop this in with any theme, like it just works, which is nice. <clears throat> um, and then some of the JavaScript we use for like an admin thing, or uh, uh, for the hero banner, there's some uh, um, some image manipulation we do as well. Uh, the banner info, again, nothing too exciting here. Um, but the one thing that we do have is the just two components um, module and. What that module is, it's kind of the parent module to all these, and so it houses some some interesting um, pieces. It has some real basic CSS that we need throughout all of the um, 
the different components, uh, like breakpoints and things of that nature. It also has a composer.json file, so we can control this and use composer to bring this into our projects as well. Um, as we look at some code, the, um, you know, I don't have a ton of code, uh, and, and hopefully um, uh, you don't as well, but we do have a couple of needs. You know, in one case, when we're using the paragraph widget, we need to make sure that we tell it um, which uh, libraries are needed. Um, so we use this hook to tell us that. Um, and then most of the rest of the code that's in these, um, these modules is really dealing with um, the, uh, the templates and making sure they're set up. So we want to override the block template. Um, and so we use a hook to, uh, uh, to, to add that suggestion. And then we, um, we register it with uh, the theme. And then uh, in the dot module file as well, we also have a couple of fields that we want to, to uh, override uh, and, and uh, another theme that we want. Basically, we want to make sure that if anyone is using this, that they use our templates. Uh, you can't override them, but we want them to, to really be mindful when they do that. You know, and then what do the templates look like? What do the template files look like? Um, you know, we have, this is that container template, so we're going to talk about uh, the carousels um, and, and make sure those are set up right. Uh, and then we have our for loop to go through our individual banners. Uh, and then we include that template right from here um, as needed. And then, uh, you know, pretty straightforward in banner template, but this is the template that we use to build those individual banners out. Uh, so some things to consider uh, as you do this yourself. Um, you know, uh, we f I feel very strongly it's a good idea, but you need to, m to make sure you kind of think it through. Um, one is just how you're going to plan to build your sites. You know, as I mentioned before, you know, originally we were doing the, the block thing, um, you know, the block layout, and then we've, we've transitioned, and so our code base has had to transition with us as well. Uh, but if you're going to plan to do this, make sure you think through that as well. And, you know, in the case, um, you know, of Layout Builder for us, we didn't know if it would take off or not, so we built our, our code to handle both ways. Um, uh, and, and we're still there right now. Um, you know, I, I glossed over this a little bit, but you know, how sophisticated are your editors? Um, you know, if you are working with folks that are in a marketing department that are really dedicated to their craft, uh, you can give them a lot more freedom, uh, and you can give them a lot, um, you know, more complexity in the UI. Uh, if your content editor is, you know, someone that does this like every other Friday for an hour, like you want to, you know, tone down. Um, how complex things are. Um, how will you extend the functionality? So as you think about your components, you, you have to think about it a little bit into the future and, and then understand like what's your approach going to be to, to do this. Not necessarily technically, but you know, what's, you know, how are you going to use your components? So um, our base components are more basic than some of the components we have. Um, you know, uh, on some of the sites. And so, you know, understanding, you know, that our idea is everyone's going to get this or no one's going to get this um, in the functionality standpoint, you know, helps us understand how we're going to extend that functionality. Uh, make sure you're able, you know, we, we also can override the templates and the themes and all that good stuff. So we're in a pretty good place there. And then, you know, how do your projects incorporate these components is another thing. Um, you know, um, we use Composer, I'm sure most people use Composer, uh, but making sure you have your projects set up correctly so that you can pull those things in, uh, those components in, and make it really easy for you to do those updates as you add, you know, functionality uh, to your component base. All right. So what have we learned? Uh, so one of the things that we learned is that um, what's clear in my mind and what I know isn't clear in everyone else's mind. So we need to make sure that everyone's on board, right? Uh, and it's not just developers, it's everyone. So it's project managers, it's, it's uh, especially designers, uh, you know, business analysts, everybody. Everyone needs to know what's going on um, because you want people to speak up if things uh, are not working as they should. And then, you know, it's not enough to like do like a training session and get people going. 
you need to continuously do this. So on a recent project that we had, we didn't use the components because the architect who was new to our, our company just didn't know we had them. So, um, you know, live and learn, I guess, but make sure that everyone as they come on board um, are taught about it. Uh, default the system to using it. So better than just telling people to use it, um, you know, make sure that it's the default choice. Make sure you have to opt out. Uh, for us, we have a, our own starter project that we use to build our sites. Uh, and so um, a project in the near future or a task in the near future is just to make sure that these components are included by default. Uh, make people opt out of them. And if you don't have a starter project, hopefully you have like a starter checklist or something uh, and make sure you add it to it. And then the last part is uh, you know, key for me, which is to make sure that you schedule a demo with the team before you start. Uh, because you don't want to get partially through your design phase and then start to introduce the concept to the designers. Um, lastly, this is a great idea uh, and we use it and we love it. Uh, it doesn't work for everything, right? So um, make sure we're, you know you think through uh, on the project for you, you use it. Yes, I want you to default to it, but you know, make sure that there isn't a good reason not to use it. Um, you know, sometimes the designers are just going to design things uh, that don't fit your components, and you've decided you're not going to add them to your components. So leave that component out. It doesn't mean you can't use the other components, right? There's still value in using 10 of the 12 or 15 of the 17 or whatever you have. Uh, but you know, make sure that we're mindful we're using it. Um, and also, I would say make sure that the content editors are comfortable with you know, how you have the components set up. Um, you know, a recent example from, from you know, f about this for us was we had a, a company that we built and launched a site with, um, you know, earlier this year. And uh, as we were going through um, the process with them, they said it's really awesome, but we're not ready for it. So uh, we still built the site. And we still used our components, but we found ways to add guardrails to really focus them on it. And as they get more comfortable with content editing, when they get more comfortable with Drupal, we can start to pull those guardrails away and give them the full power uh, that we'd like to. And then lastly, um, clients uh, can have unique requirements. And um, you know, we, we had a, a recent site build uh, where we needed to replatform uh, a number of sites. And um, as we worked with the client to establish budget and all those things, we said, hey, we're going to have to um, condense your components from some unseemly number across the seven sites to another, to another number. And everyone agreed. And then once we got into the build, like all of the people that owned the individual sites were like, well, I want my component, not you know, this one that doesn't have all my features. Uh, and so ultimately, we. Um, didn't use our components, we built some new components that, that gave them some, some different functionality uh, and flexibility. Uh, but ultimately, you know, requirements might just prevent you from doing it. So, that was quick. Uh, come to contribution days on Thursday and help us out, help make Drupal better. Um, let us know what you think of both DrupalCon and, Drupal, uh, and this session in particular. Are there any questions? Yes? Um, my question is about uh, what kit you use in order to use your solution for that. Does it work with responsive design? Uh, does it work with bootstrap team and so on? Uh, ours works with responsive. Um, I don't think we use bootstrap for it. Oh, sorry. The, the question is, um, do the components work with resp responsive uh, and, uh, and or uh, with bootstrap? So yeah, they're all responsive. I didn't show it on, the, on the, the screen, but if we compress those right out of the box, they're all responsive and they work well. Um, and I don't think we use bootstrap in it, but there's no reason that yours can't. Is there a specific team to use that or there should be, can be used any team? Anybody should be able to use it. Anyone our, any of our projects, you know, can and will use these the components. Does it require some additional adjustments to get that working with this team? Each individual site might have more things that they have to do with them to make it fit within okay. the other sites. But yeah, you know, out of the box, they work. 
and they're styled and they look pretty, but there certainly are some adjustments that might have to be made. Hmm? I'm going to repeat the question and let me know if I got it right. Um, you know, the we, um, I seem to be against custom modules, and I am. Um, what um, in in this use case? But then I think the question is: Are they set up in a repository, and how do we work with them? Yeah, how do you extend it to customize? <clears throat> yeah, I think. Um, uh, I, yeah, I think what you end up with, if you really need to do those customizations is you're going to have a custom module that, that only has those pieces of it. So you don't have to build, rebuild the whole thing. Hopefully you can just add, you know, like if you need additional fields, some additional CSS, you should be able to just add that in a custom module and kind of layer on top of it, but then get the benefit of all, you know, that's been previously built. You know, and then for us too, you know, if there is a use case and we really like the functionality, We'll just build it into the component, and then you know uh, we use Git to keep track of the versioning. So you can use Composer to grab the specific version you want, and so we can you know make sure that we pull in um, the right version. It's a living, breathing ecosystem, right? And and you know as we learn more, as you know you learn more, you're going to have to keep growing it. Such an approach. I guess that uh, needs uh, an additional effort to, to implement that. And uh, when you start a new project uh, where you identify such a component, who, who will, uh, <coughs> from the budget point of view and deadline, so who will uh, cover that uh, such effort? It's the first customer, or how do you deal with such a so uh, I'll repeat the question as best I can, uh, and then you let me know if I got it right. Um, I think the question was, it costs money to do this, and who incurs the first, you know, the cost? Uh, and it's a really good question. Uh, how we approach that, um, well, the, the easy answer is what we've already done. And um, with this particular approach, um, I use bench time for my developers, and so I just made the investment um, into it, and we were using it uh, for a couple of ways. One is to get, you know, a, this you know efficiency built into the practice a bit, which is really good. But it was also to get some folks a little bit of experience with with Drupal eight as well. Um, so there's that. Um, and then the question is going forward: What will we do? Um, and that's you know it's a it depends. Um, you know, it depends on our relationship with the client. You know, sometimes we would you know, just, you know, have a relationship where we could just pull it in into our common components and not worry about it. Um, you know, and if that's if that's not the case and we really wanted it, then I would find bench time and I would rebuild it. How do you find the configuration? So the question is, how do we bundle the configuration? Um, yeah, it's it's just bundled within in the module itself. We have a config directory that we use when we install it. Uh, we have a similar uh, setup. Uh, like that. Okay. But we have the, the issue that the power graphs that we use um, they are submissions with multilingual uh, websites uh, that because the translations. Always need to have the same amount of paragraphs, the same paragraphs. Uh, we also have it uh, because some of our customers really want the other language to be different uh, in, in style and in paragraphs. So there was a comment. Um, I think it's a comment that they they use a similar approach uh, that we do, uh, and there are some multilingual issues with paragraphs, uh, specifically a thing needing to have the same number of paragraphs for each language, um, and um, and then some client-specific uh, cases. 
Yeah, we haven't really run into that yet, so I, had, I don't have an answer to that particular problem, but um, it, the approach is not without challenges, but every, every approach that we have in Drupal seems to have challenges as well. Yes? The question is, if we want to add a new field to one of the components, uh, and we want to roll it out to a number of sites, how do we deal with the config? This is a really good question. We haven't had to do it yet. <laughs> uh, uh, I, su I suspect that we would end up with some, uh, some hooky code to uh, figure out uh, whether or not it was already there, and, uh, and then add the config accordingly. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, also, like that paragraph and uh, component uh, approach. Um, I see that you're working with the layout builder, nested custom box, nested paragraph, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, do you still have a consistent data model, for example, to uh, pull to views or to uh, uh, have an API that, that, that can transparently uh, disclose the same content? Uh, the question is, based on the approach, do we have a consistent data model uh, so that um, an API could pull the right data? That's, that, 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 that's one thing I should worry about with the, this uh, approach. I, maybe probably, maybe I, maybe you know, no yeah, I don't, you know, I, I don't think we've, you, you know, we haven't used it in that way. We haven't been using API to pull it out, so I don't know what you'd run into. But yeah, I, I think, you know, kind of going back to some of the, the general thoughts is like thinking through how you're going to be using them. Um, and, you know, my approach there would <clears throat> would be to to kind of, um, you know, set up a sandbox and just play around with it a little bit and make sure, you know, to see, you know, if that is an issue, then, you know, can you, Indeed, get around it. I don't. I don't have an issue or an answer to the specific issue, but, but yeah, I, you know, th that's what's you know kind of interesting about this approach is is you know you know just kind of in general, right? Not our specifics, but is that you know how you're going to use these components is going to be different than me, and you're going to run into you know some different issues you might have to tackle. Yes. Uh, we're also using a similar solution. Okay. However, the user experience, when you have so many components, so many options, it can get messy real fast. Yeah, uh, yeah. So one of the things we did uh, is we implemented the Thunder admin, which has a sort of a better UX. Okay. But still we have UX problems. It's still messy. We have any suggestions? So the, the comment was that um, they also use a similar approach. And then the question is, or in that the UX can get messy, and then are there, you know, suggestions for how to solve it? Um, you know, we haven't kind of gone through like a second version of it, um, and you know, for us, you know, you know, our users have like they're really kind of power users, and so we haven't really had to worry about it. One of the ideas that we um, Thought about though before um, and haven't executed was, you know, um, m maybe having um, you know different experience for different levels of users. So like I could assign a role to somebody, and then based on that, you know, adjust what they see. Um, the, you know, so I mean, it's it's a sticky problem, right? And it's one of the reasons why we kind of haven't left paragraphs. Although I've heard some things about Layout Builder that maybe tell me that that's going to get solved, but. You know, we can, you know, within, you know, our content types, we can say, you know, in this area, only use these components, and in this area, only use these components, th those types of things. Um, but, you know, yeah, it's, you know, but, and it's one of the reasons we, we started with 12, because we don't want 100, because, you know, even talking to clients in general, not even considering this project, that's a problem. You know, they're like, hey, we need, you know, our current site has like 112 components and we need them all. And you're like, no, nah, not really. Um, 
you won't like that. Uh, the the one thing I, I saw recently um, was uh, with Acquia acquiring Cohesion. I saw a demo of it. They're not a you know showing for Acquia, but Cohesion seems to take. I mean, I don't know how it's architected, but it seems to take kind of a similar approach to what we're doing. And they have a pretty pretty unique UI uh, that looks like it's pretty pretty snazzy. So I would I would you know would you take a look at that? That might give you some ideas as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Have you used uh, Humo Selector to push that approach? We have done it, it works quite nicely. Really? So um, there was a comment that they use view mode selector with the approach and it works well. Uh, and he said, we don't yet, but uh, I'm going to take that as a note and, uh, and go back to the office and, and check that out. All right. If there's no other questions, uh, thank you for your time. And uh, if you need to get a hold of me, there I am. Thank you.